Good morning. This is Tal M. Klein, the author of The Punch Escrow. I'll see you in the future. Welcome to Too Much Scrolling for September 7th, 2021. I'm Steve Fodor. And I'm Chip Hassan Flog. We're just a couple of guys sitting around talking about things that are important to us. Hopefully they're important to you. And if you need more information, there's so many great ways to find more information. Chip, it's really easy to just show up on my doorstep during the course of the week, isn't it? Well, Steve, as long as you have Oktoberfest beer, I think we all have a good time when we show up at your doorstep. <laughs> That's what happened. I told you that I bought Oktoberfest a couple weeks ago, and I was ready for September, and you said, ah, September's coming. I'm going to go knock on Steve's door now. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, that's going to be the only uh, Oktoberfest really going on, Steve. Come and knock on my door. <laughs> down, film at 11. Brings us to our film at 11, our movie of the week. Chip, you went to a movie theater and watched a movie this week. It wasn't quite a private showing, Steve. I think I had probably six to eight people in there with me. And I asked them, how could they be there when I was there? Don't they know that COVID's going on? But I, I sat in the middle of the theater. What can I say? So what did you see? I saw Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, Steve. Ah. The Marvel Comics Universe the... um, latest film. So the... the Okay, so... I, you know me, I am anti-trailer. I know almost nothing about this movie. So non-spoilers, tell us about the story of Shang-Chi. I was thinking, and I absolutely could be wrong without thinking too deeply. This may be the only character that there has been an MCU story about that has not had some connection to Jack Kirby. Kirby uh, was not a person who who wrote this. And in fact, I don't think that Stan Lee uh, has any connection to this character either. So this was after the 60s when you had Fantastic Four and you had um, Spider-Man and, and Avengers and things of that nature. Uh, this was that next wave of characters being created by the people who read those books. And so Shang-Chi is a character that came about in the 1970s that was right when Kung Fu was becoming incredibly popular. So Bruce Lee movies were out. Marvel's response to that was Shang-Chi and also uh, Danny Rand, which was the Iron Fist. DC, which is the competitive company, came out with the Karate Kid, Steve, just so you know. Well, that was the mid 80s then, right? No, that was the 70s. That Karate was the Kid, 70s. Karate Kid was 70s? Wow. The, uh, the comic book character. Comic gotcha. Book character, gotcha. And anyway, um, I did not have particularly high hopes for this film. I knew that there would be a lot of care taken for it. And I really thought that the Marvel Comics universe had kind of played out. But I, I'm going to be blunt about it. Uh, I think they did a very good job with it. They took what would be a D or an E level character. And they made a story out of it. It has Aquafina in it, Steve. Just saying so you know, she's. I love she's Aquafina. I, I will watch her in anything. I, w I will say that the I felt that the jokes were kind of flat. They'd become tro tropes that okay. we kind of how the little jumps through it. Our lead actor, I'm going to say his name, Simu Liu, and it could be I could be mispronouncing that. He solicited for this character when a, one of the other Marvel movies came out. And it's lovely that he got picked to play this character because, you know, it's he said, I want to play him. And he did an incredible good job. Kevin Feige and the entire MCU staff, they do an incredible job casting these films. And while different, it's very similar to what Black Panther meant to the black community i remember showing up at opening night and just all the families who were there mm -hmm. and just what a celebration this wonderful film was this is one that i think was made for the chinese uh, audience mm -hmm. and they took a lot of care for part of the film it's a reading film steve okay 
but they've got a, a wonderful cast. There's good humor in it. There's lots of uh, homages to uh, uh, the kung fu type of movies that Bruce Lee would have put on, or 70s type films. Not quite so, the sweaty 70s, Steve, but certainly it was there. And it's it's a very uh, it's got wonderful action sequences. I, I do think this is a little flat. In fact, I was trying to figure out what grade I would give it on my 100-point scale. And I would say 60 out of 100. And my, let me explain a little bit what I, I, I'm saying when I say that. This is not a bad film. This is a, a film that people will enjoy, who really enjoy this genre. But it is also a trope. We've seen this film before. And even though it's very different... It's it's the same. It's okay. the, the, the the same presentation. And how many of these can we go through? Well, if you are a person who likes these films, you will leave loving this. I think that you will continue to move on. My idea that maybe the superhero genre has played out could be wrong because if all the films are like this, I think that they will have legs. Okay. But but at the same time. If you are a person who doesn't like superhero films and hasn't enjoyed the MCU, then I, I don't think that you're going to find any joy in this because you've seen this film before. It's just with different characters. So it's more superhero than Kung Fu in your estimation? It is, it is more Iron Man than Bruce Lee? Oh, no, it's both. Okay. It's both. It, it's, got, it's got elements of both. I mean, and in fact, that's the beautiful part about it. There are beautiful sequences of using martial arts. Okay. And um, you see the beauty uh, of the movements. Mm -hmm. And you cannot help but just, I mean, after, afterwards, you know, just if you've ever seen a group of people performing some kind of martial arts together, there's just something joyous about it. And so controlled and stuff like that. And, and, Many people, and me included, are, were just fascinated by these old cultures where mm. these traditions had somehow developed that are so different from the West. Mm. And it's just, there's there's a, a lovely part of it. There's a lot of playfulness with Chinese mythology in it. I think they did an incredible job at doing it. There is a su surprise guest appearance that I won't tell you about. Okay. That is so much fun that uh, I, I, I don't think it was as shocking as, as I thought it would be. But let's just say that there's there's a lot of great humor about this. Okay. And so, you know, is it a great film? No. Is it a serviceable film? Absolutely. Should people who enjoy this type of film enjoy it? Absolutely. They're going to make more more of it. It totally set us up for, I think, the Eternals, or at least the Spider Man movie. Mm. So the Eternals is being released in, um, I think, November, and then we have Spider Man released in December. Um, yes, these should be fun fun films. So my question is: Is this worth a trip to the theater? Because this is the movie that Disney and Marvel are releasing. In the theater only. They are not releasing it in a home viewing manner for 45 days, unlike what they did with the Black Widow. So they released the Black Widow at 19.99, and I said, "There's no way I'm paying 19.99 for a film uh, through Disney Plus." Uh, but let's be blunt about it. I spent $25 going to the theater because I was there and I bought my $10 ticket and then bought popcorn and a drink. That was $15. Right. So what is, would I have been better off with a Disney Plus type of release? Most likely. I would have spent about the same. Those were $29.99, not $19.99. It was were 30 they? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just seems to be a little, uh, little uh, pricey, and I think that we're going to continue to have playfulness. The, the companies like Disney are going to play on how to release these things. I think that they are experimenting in all sorts of ways with how is how we are going to experience these movies. Uh, Steve Stearns, one of our, our happy listeners, was really debating with himself about how, how sure he was about going out to a theater. Is the risk 
of COVID worth the reward of having a night out and watching a movie? I did not go to the theater to see this movie. I have not seen this movie because I did not go out to see it. That's a, that's a struggle that companies are going to run into here. Well, I was in a virtually empty theater. Correct. But on that same note, two weeks from now is uh, two weeks after Labor Day. Mm. What did we see last year after Labor Day? We saw a spike in COVID cases. What are we going to see this year? We're going to see a spike in COVID cases. And there's the real dilemma that we're going to be continue to be run, run into this entire um, year, and potentially for the next year or so, mm. is going to be these ebbs and flows of COVID cases. And listen, nobody's saying, hey, stop enjoying life. But is it worth it to go see the Chicago Bears at Soldier Field and sit with the 60,000 people? Or is it better to watch it at home where you can control your your environment? Right. And I I, I just, I think that there's going to be the play. I I don't know if I'm willing to go to the theater again. I say that knowing that we're going to be talking about a film coming out and I go, oh, I'm going to watch this. You know, do you wait 45 days and, and just let it stream? And probably. just try to avoid the spoilers and all the fun of of the film that you had in seeing it on opening day. Yeah. Shang-Chi, great cast, reasonable story. You've seen it before, but worthy of its place in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It is one of the better ones. And that, that sets a, setting a pretty high standard, though. But still, you've seen it before. Okay. This brings me to my film that I watched this week. It's called The Year Earth Changed. This is a 45-minute documentary about 2020. The amazing, stunning footage of empty streets around the world when everybody was in COVID lockdown. And the idea of this documentary is, is what the animal kingdom did while that was happening. And and it, they make a... a which explains the narrator, Steve. Right. It's it's narrated by David Attenborough, who is the voice of nature, right? <laughs> That's the guy that you want if you're going to talk about nature in a documentary. They make a leap of logic that says that humans who are doing human things are impeding the natural things that animals would do without humans. And, and it's... I can see it. I, I can understand where their logic is there, but it's more to the point that maybe we're doing harm to not just the animal kingdom. Maybe there's there's more to it than that. It was a pretty simplistic view, but the footage was beautiful and the narration was wonderful. Well, if you think about Detroit and, and the changes that went from what was a major city, like one of the world big cities, to a city that they've had to bulldoze neighborhoods and it's gone back to prairie. Yeah. I mean, it certainly shows that how dramatically things can change yeah. very quickly. Mm -hmm. And and you throw in COVID for this is you know, that's a different and you could see where, you know, all of a sudden those coyotes have a, more places to roam. Roman coyotes. Yes. Now they can chase the uh, the Roadrunner more, Steve. He's never going to catch that Roadrunner. All these years he's been trying to catch that Roadrunner. It's never going to happen. It could be because he keeps ordering from Acme. There's got to be other companies that can help. Can other companies ship? I don't know. We'll find <laughs> out. You showed up on my doorstep this week, and, and we decided to sit down and have some fun, and I was watching the movie Better Off Dead from 1985, one of my favorite movies, and I, I roped you into watching this movie with me, Chip. I watched a few minutes of it. It <laughs> stars John Cusack, Steve. Yes, John Chicago's Cusack. Chicago's own own. Yes, a very young teenage John Cusack and the the old 1980s style of storytelling, and I just absolutely love it. That's from 1985. Steve. The the year 1985 is the year that everything was wonderful, Chip. That's my nostalgia year. Okay. <laughs> 
wonderful. The everything was going really well in Chicago in 1985. That's all and, I have to say. And what I found interesting is you're saying that this film cannot be streamed. Yeah, I I had to go into the archives and find the DVD of Better Off Dead. It is not available on any platform anywhere that I could find it. What's a DVD, Steve? There's got to be young people who don't know what a DVD is. I had to plug in. I had to find a DVD player. I had to plug in that machine to put this plastic disc in to in order to watch this movie to find the joy of this nostalgia. So why is this story important to you? Well, the reason why I watched it this week is because of a story that Patrick Capone <laughs> told us on Sunday night on the Vinyl Vault on the Rock Station here in Chicago. He was driving his Corvette, and his Corvette has a radio and a cassette tape player, and that radio hasn't worked for years. And so he was just driving around on the weekends like he does in his Corvette, and he decided, for whatever crazy reason, to stick a knife in and try to get that cassette out of that cassette player it's been stuck in there and for whatever reason this time it popped out and it was van halen women and children first and pat thought about it because wait a minute this album came out in 1980 and this corvette that he's driving is a 1979 corvette he wondered has that tape been stuck in that tape player since it was released in 1980? Has it been that long that this car was not able to make music? And and got me thinking about the nostalgia of 1985, the idea of how much Van Halen specifically and music in general influenced my lifestyle in 1985 and how the Chicago Bears won the Super Bowl in 1985 and Chicago was a big part of my life. And this movie, as silly as it is, is, is just one of those movies that I, I use for nostalgia. So David Lee Roth was offered the opening spot on Motley Crue's tour. Mm -hmm. And David Lee Roth responded, I don't open for bands I inspired. How about that? <laughs> That's that's David Lee Roth in 2021 for sure. That is, David Lee Roth is a very different artist today than he was then. And I think he's probably still not the nicest guy. There's a lot of David Lee Roth stories about his excesses on the road. And I don't think he's changed a lot. But he's he's older and wiser for sure. Well, Steve, de plain, de plain. <laughs> You, a Chip, I, I, I know you don't watch television, but I know that you are familiar with the old TV show Fantasy Island. I'm Mr. Rourke, your host. <laughs> There's a new Fantasy Island on Fox, and my wife and I are really enjoying this program. It is definitely written... For the older crowd, maybe even not Gen X, maybe it's written for our parents who have fond memories of Fantasy Island, but the storylines of this new series are very Twilight Zone, they are very adult relationship conversations about how we work together about grandkids about adult children there's there's so many different situations that we can identify ourselves in these stories i really think everybody should be watching this fantasy island on fox is it as uh, debonair as uh, Ricardo Montalban? It, it, the the miss rourke who is the great niece of Mr. Rourke is very debonair, and her sidekick definitely has uh, some style to her, and it is a fun show to watch. In the darkest word, fun, I could think of. There are some dark, thoughtful conversations about relationships in this series. So does a star con... <laughs> John! Sorry. That, that, that reference, those of you who don't understand that reference, our next show is What If, which I continue to watch on Disney+, Plus, and this week's episode is all about Doctor Strange, who is played by Benedict Cumberbatch. Benedict huh? Cumberbatch played, huh? <laughs> played a character in one of the Star Trek movies that was not Khan until suddenly he was Khan, and the, it's, it's so convoluted. That is the most convoluted reference you've made for a while, Chip. 
That's deep cut, Steve. That's a John! deep cut. No, his name's Khan, not John. Doctor Strange is featured in the latest episode of What If? And the storyline goes to what if Doctor Strange was in a car accident and instead of losing his ability to be a surgeon like he originally did in the original MCU, what if the love of his life, Christine, died in that car accident instead? What would happen? And, and isn't this... that the interesting question? Because it, it, it really gets down to whether this is a whether you have the ability to impact fate or not that's exactly it that's exactly what happens here he becomes obsessed with traveling back in time to save this one human the love of his life he becomes a very very dark character as a result of this obsession and fate keeps killing her in different ways we read she was dressed up she was ready to go out mm -hmm. eventually they have to try pizza right they did try pizza they stopped and, and stopped for pizza and and fate stepped in even in the pizza situation it didn't really work out for him yeah this this becomes a very dark conversation about our own choices in life and fate and and how we how we go through and get past all of the disappointments in our lives. This, once again, features all of the original actors from the MCU, Benedict Cumberbatch, Rachel McAdams, Benedict Wong, and Tilda Swinton as the Ancient One who shows up, even though the Ancient One has passed away, she still shows up and gives some real advice to Doctor Strange. Well, everyone needs an Obi-Wan, Steve. And I just wanted to hear Benedict Cumberbatch say, yeah, no doy. There's a yeah, no doy line in this, Chip. Well, there you go. You don't get a lot of no doy anymore. <laughs> <laughs> One of the interesting conversations that's being had around this episode in the community is the idea of fridging the 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 comic book trope where a female character is killed and therefore leads to a male character having motivation to do something this is a this is a trope that we've seen over and over again in comics so for any person who's not um really understanding the reference of fridging it, it comes from gail simone she was a writer who uh basically uh had a, blog, a website where she talked about women in refrigerators and it was based on a, a green lantern story and where the green lantern found his girlfriend in a refrigerator and it led to some action and what they did was they reviewed a lot of stories and it seemed to be a trope. It seemed to be something that was showing up more often than it probably should. And, and she was saying that this is just not a correct way to find motivation to do something. It is and problematic for way. sure. There's yeah. got to be a better way to write a story than making the female character into an object and objectifying this as I can't do, go on without this person or i am going to f seek revenge or vengeance upon those who wrought this pain that it's it's so problematic all right well steve tell us a little bit about star trek lower decks i continue to watch star trek lower decks as well it's it's still wonderful uh, those of you who are star trek fans will see it and understand all of the little easter eggs that they've placed into it those of you who are not fans of star trek uh, my family is watching this with me and they are enjoying it even though they're not in the knowledge category that i am for star trek but this week's episode uh the main character one of the main characters of star trek lower decks uh has a trans transporter accident and splits into two separate people and that sounded really familiar to me and, and it turns out that is the story that tal klein told us in 2017 in the punch escrow where a teleporter accident splits a person into two separate people and the question is what rights 
do those two identical people then have? Do they have the same rights as the first individual? Is one individual the owner of the rights and the other one lost? Do both of them have no rights? How does that work? They don't analyze it nearly as much in this episode as Tal does in the punch escrow, but it's in there. And I was very intrigued by that question. It's a very interesting topic. Who, who has rights in that situation? Do both have rights to the same assets? Mm-hmm. I mean, think you, you can just think of this as a legal question. Who is the person? Mm-hmm. So in Tao's book, they asked, uh, so when one person leaves and the other person is recreated, that person who is recreated has all the rights of the person who left because that person no longer exists. Mm-hmm. And when they're both living, one has rights and the other one does not. So mm-hmm. interesting. It's, interesting. It's an interesting, intriguing story. I, I endorse both Star Trek Lower Decks and Tal Klein's The Punch Escrow, some of my favorite writing in the last five years. Opening this week, we've got a very, very interesting, very good-looking movie called The Card Counter. Oh, this looks excellent, Steve. It stars Green Goblin. <laughs> Willem Dafoe. Uh, Oscar Isaacs, Ty Sheridan, and Tiffany Haddish. This is an all-star cast. This is from the mind of Paul Schrader, whose name I had to look up. I did not know Paul Schrader's work, but he is responsible for so many of the great films of the 20th century. The card counter is opening in theaters only, so I I don't know when I will get a chance to see this movie, but it seems like a a really intense revenge thriller. Uh, I look forward to seeing the card counter. Well, these types of movies are always great. I mean, on the grand scheme, you can think of a movie like 21 that that, uh, talked about card counting. Mm -hmm. But this movie looks really, really good, especially in the trailer when the guy's wrapping up everything in the hotel room. So, yeah, nothing can be touched. Hmm. Book it, book it, book it. Book it, book it, book it. Book it. Book it. Brings us to our book it, our book of the week. I have been reading an interesting murder mystery called The Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle. And I say Evelyn because the narrator uh, that I was listening to an audiobook for this one, the narrator was British. This is a very, very British book with a British narrator. And apparently, in Britain, they say Evelyn instead of Evelyn. Evelyn, yes. Crabtree and Evelyn, Steve. There's a brand that's known as that. You can go get some soaps. I I always thought that He-Man was using the name Evil Lynn because she was evil. And the new Masters of the Universe cartoon explained that her name is actually Lynn and she added the evil to her name. Now I understand that's a joke because they say Evil Lynn in Britain. So is this a, uh, a book about a cat's life? No, this is not a cat story. This is a young lady who is embroiled in a classic type of murder mystery. This is Agatha Christie style. All of these people have gathered together and there's a murder mystery to be solved. But the twist is that our narrator is jumping between all of the characters involved and they spend a day in the body of each of the characters. And from their perspective, they are seeing that one day over and over and over again from each of the perspectives of each of the characters in the story. The murder actually happens at the end of the day. And the narrator needs to solve the murder in order to break out of this eternal day to day, one day, over and over again storyline. That sounds familiar, Chip. This is interesting, Steve. So if there was five characters who are part of this murder, or mm-hmm. you think of Clue, yes. then each, you, you have a chapter with, or at least part of the book, with inside each of the characters' heads. 
and seeing the same actions of this one day from a different perspective. This is Groundhog Day meets Agatha Christie in in a really nice, well-put-together murder mystery. Again, very British, very much not the same uh, comedy trope of the Groundhog Day experience. This is very much a dry murder mystery like Agatha Christie wrote. Well, so are you selling us? Did you like this book? I ain't... I like the concept more than the execution. I like the idea more than what was actually written in this book. The author is British. The author is giving us these clues. And it's... Here's here's my frustration. Many times in murder mystery books, the murderer is revealed to be a character we've never met before. Okay. And that is very similar to what happens in this story. Its its twist is... Uh, okay, I won't give away the twist. There is a twist on that trope, but it is still not as rewarding for me, the reader, as, for instance, the movie Clue. In the movie Clue, somebody in that room was absolutely the murderer, and we had to solve the murder along with the characters. This is that trope where there's there's information that the author is not giving us, or at least is giving us in such a Easter eggy way that we might miss the information. That's frustrating to me. Okay. Okay. But this is still a good story. This is well written, well executed, and again, the concept is is wonderful. I love the idea of seeing things from different perspectives, seeing the same day over and over again with different viewpoints is is well executed. Okay. That's the seven and a half deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. Scroll with it. Brings it to our scroll with it. There's there's plenty of news out there, Chip, and uh, let's let's talk about some things. The first thing that we've we've been following very closely is what Apple is doing to try to protect children. So what, what's happening is Apple made an announcement that they were going to allow, a, a, I guess, a computer program to crawl inside your Apple devices and, and look for child pornography. So nobody thinks that child pornography is uh, acceptable on, on any level. But what the challenge of this is that you have what's on your iPhone, what's on your, your tablet, what's on your computers should be encrypted. And if it's encrypted, how can anybody go and see what's going on in there? So either something is encrypted or it's not. Apple employees or some empl- Apple employees have absolutely said, you're absolutely right. This is a violation of privacy. And like I said, no one is defending um, criminal activity, but we we are defending is it's is either something is encrypted or it's not. Mm-hmm. And so, what Apple has has at least announced is they're going to delay their um, the implementation of this. And my hope is that they abandon this. In fact, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a group that, that talks a little bit about uh, privacy issues, basically says you know delaying this is not good enough. Apple must just say, we're going to abandon this. And like I said, no one is defending criminal activity. But what we are defending is you've sold that privacy is important. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that privacy remains the foundation of what what differentiates Apple from companies like Microsoft or Google, who basically have no problem uh, selling your information. Yeah, this is this is a story that we've been talking about for weeks now, and and we absolutely want to maintain privacy, and we also want to fight criminal activity, and we we need to find that balance between those two things. Breaking encryption makes encryption broken, no matter how tiny the break is. So we wanted to also uh, address uh, COVID is certainly still in the news. And a couple of weeks from now, chances are after Labor Day, we we are going to see an uptick in COVID cases. 
and schools are are going to start uh, for areas that schools are not currently in session. Mm-hmm. And in Texas, uh, around the Waco area, the school district there had two social studies teachers pass away from COVID. And that is our worst fear, isn't it? It's it's yeah. basically as school starts, basically people getting sick and dying. Yeah. The argument that children are less susceptible to COVID does not mean that children can't bring COVID to others. And we need to protect everybody. And sorry, our teachers are important to us, especially on this show. Not not everyone has the same immune system. Yeah. And I, I recognize that the need, I mean, the desire to have children learn. I want my kids in school. I absolutely want my students in school. My lifestyle of talking to the television during the Zoom era was terrible, and I love having them in school. But we need to make sure that the protections are in place and that we are being safe for everybody. Well, I, I don't know how you would use protections in place i mean the idea Mm -hmm. of masking and washing hands and things like that would be certainly part of the the solution to allowing Mm -hmm. that to happen but we we still are going to have people at risk and we're going to see what where we're going to see this is listen your your dentist's office where you get your hair cut where you get your you go and you buy food stuff like that i don't think the government's going to mandate closures but what's going to happen is they're going to people be missing and they're going to be missing because they got COVID and they may not tell the public that, Hey, listen, we have 10 employees here at this dental office. Three of them had COVID. They're not going to be here for the next 10 to 15 days hmm. or more, but we're going to remain open. And I think that's really what we're going to, it's going to be the norm. And I'm not sure if that's even better. That's a better yeah. way of dealing with it. And all of the result of all of that is all sorts of problems with logistics and moving things and getting the parts that we need to make all the things. And and there's so many, so many things that are affected by this COVID. Well, Steve, there are so few people named Chip out there. That would be one of them. (laughs) Steve, is there something going on? That's what this is. The headline is there's a chip shortage and GM is shutting down production because there's not enough people named Chip. Now I get it. They should go to Chipotle. Chipotle is the place for Chip. (laughs) Anyway, um, COVID is creating all sorts of challenges and GM is really going to shut down their automobile production for a while while they try to build up a supply of chips. That is disaster story stuff right there. That is, we can't find enough people to make this stuff happen. We can't get the chips that we need to make the cars, so we're just going to shut down production of the cars. We'll be right back with production of the cars. No, really, it'll be right back. Well, we've seen a little bit of the results of that. Uh, Used car prices have, have gone up. And if there's not enough supply, certainly prices go up. And if we devalue the currency, prices go up. There's all sorts of things at play right now. Certainly that we could read uh, negative uh, thoughts into them. But GM, basically what they're doing right now is going to be delay releasing some automobiles because the supply chain can't provide the chips that they need right now. Certainly it's just one of those areas that we deal with when we're dealing in a pandemic. And one of the parts of that supply chain is the logistics of this. There's a world record number of ships docked off the coast of California right now. 44 different container ships are sitting idle in the ocean waiting for dock space. There's not enough dock workers. There's not enough drivers to get this stuff from the docks to where it needs to go. And so we have a supply chain problem right now. And that means uh, what? The Guinness Book of World Records is there, Steve. Counting ships. Well, I thought they were pouring beer really, really slowly. They let the head come to them. Delicious. Winter is coming. Winter, winter you (laughs) need to drink more Guinness. There's no doubt about that. After the Oktoberfest is gone, then you start in on the Guinness. Did you say winter is coming, Steve? That sounds very Game of Thrones. Yes, that was my Game of Thrones reference. A show that I've never seen. (laughs) Steve, if you were going to play video games, you want to become a world-class video game competitor, 
How many hours a week would you need to work? I don't know. That's a that's a great question. I would I would suspect that that would be a full time job. Something like you know f- not, six or eight hours a day, five days a week. I would think. Well, not for the Chinese, Steve. They're more efficient. <laughs> China has put into place a law that limits video gaming for children to three hours per week. Well, I I don't know how they'll become uh, world-class competitors, Steve. The Olympics are ruined. When when eSports becomes a part of the Olympics, China is going to be behind on this, aren't they? Yeah, it looks like it. It looks like it. The idea is to limit these activities to try to mitigate addiction to these games and boy that 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 sounds very un-american doesn't it something tells me they'll be watching a lot of twitch (laughs) watching other people playing video games instead of playing them themselves i still don't understand twitch i don't understand the 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 kids these days chip when i when i was their age If I went over to my friend's house and my friend played video games and didn't let me play, that was the most boring time ever. I don't understand the joy that the kids get from watching other people play video games. Well, Steve Pong certainly isn't the game it used to be. I love Pong and Breakout. I told my students about the story of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak creating Breakout and how much of a a jerk Steve Jobs was in that story. Well, they were even, they were asking, who is Steve Jobs? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> is that your Ayn Rand? Is that your Ayn Rand <laughs> nod for the day? No, my, my, feel, my feeling is, is you, you, you brought up a historical figure, Steve. You might as well have been talking about, I don't know, Albert Einstein, Napoleon, uh, Cleopatra. You know, he's just a guy from the past. Socrates. Socrates. <laughs> piggy, All right. piggy, piggy, piggy. All right, I think that's enough references to to really old stuff that make no sense. A lot of deep cuts today, Steve. <laughs> so tune in. So tune in next week to listen to more two old guys remember stuff. Sort of. <laughs> Bill and Ted. Bill and Ted's excellent adventure uh, references, Steve. I'm sure all the kids will get it. Be excellent to each other. <laughs> Party on, dudes. All right, Chip. I I don't know. I think we have enough information to survive another week. What do you think? Only if we can come back next week, Steve. <laughs> Wonderful. If you need more information, give us a call or a text. Our phone number is 805-4104-TMS. Our website is toomuchscrolling.com. Our email is toomuchscrolling at gmail.com. We're on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. We're on iTunes and Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. And you can always ask your smart speaker to play the latest episode of Too Much Scrolling. I want to thank you again for listening to Too Much Scrolling. I'm Steve Foder. I'm Chip Hessenfluck. We'll see you in the future. Dudes. We don't talk about what I want to talk about. What I want to thank you for. What I want to talk about.